morning, church. How are we doing? It's good to see you. I had a couple people ask me today, well, I'm surprised you came since Clemson lost last night. Um, I don't really put my trust in 18 or 19-year-old kids. I put my trust in Jesus. I specifically don't put my trust in Clemson's defense, right? Um, Congratulations, Aggies. Good stuff. Turning your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 39. We got some work to do this morning. Genesis chapter 39. The Longhorns didn't play anybody. Genesis chapter 39. (laughs) I tell you, I'm a huge, I'm a huge uh, strong fan. I'm for anything that helps our tithing. Uh, So go Longhorns. Um, Hook them indeed. I love football, but I love Jesus more. So we're going to talk about him this morning. Um. Genesis 39. This is, this is not a uh, Jerry Springer text. We got out of those. But this is a, I'd put it in a general hospital text, if you know that soap opera. Um, it, it's still, but I think it's very relevant. So um, we're going to have fun with it. Let me pray for us and we'll hit it. Father, thank you for Genesis 39. Thank you for uh, the relevancy of this text and how even though this is a 4,000-year-old book, uh, this text is so connected to what we struggle with today in this culture. I pray that we'd struggle well, we would listen well, and you would change us in a great way this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So Joseph, where the Joseph story is so refreshing to have a good example to preach from. We've been talking a lot about sin and folly and bad examples all the way through Genesis. Now we have Joseph. Joseph is the 11th of 12 brothers. Um, The good news is his father loved him. The bad news is his father favored him to the other brothers, so the other brothers hated him. So the other brothers came up with a plan how to get rid of Joseph. They beat him up. They put him in a cistern and they were going to literally kill him before they decided to kill him. They decided we'd eat some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. We'll have lunch. We'll eat some Cheetos. We'll figure out what to do with Joseph. And then they decided instead of killing him, instead of having his blood on our hands, why don't we sell him and we can make a profit? So they sell him, some Ishmaelites come along, they buy Joseph, they take him to a place called Egypt. See if this sounds familiar. The the son that the father loved and favored came to his own and his own would have him not and his own betrayed him, lifted him up to be killed and actually when Jesus came, he goes into Egypt himself. Does this sound just like Jesus or not? This is the Jesus story. Joseph is the Old Testament flashlight that keeps hitting to say Jesus is coming and Joseph is an amazing man and Jesus is even greater. And so now we see him going down into Egypt and the question is, and you need to understand that Joseph at this point is about an 18, 19-year-old young man. Will he be faithful in a pagan, non-Christian, ungodly culture? So we hit the story here in chapter 39, verse 1. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought him from the Ishmaelites who had had brought him down there. Um, Some of you are going through some hard stuff today. In in a room this this, this filled with people, there are circumstances, there are struggles. And the question that starts to come up when you go through a hard time is, does God care? Is God here? Does God hear my prayers? God is sovereign and God is good, and God picked the Ishmaelites to come along that road at that moment to pick Joseph up out of the cistern. And he knew exactly where Joseph was going to go. So I want you to keep that in your mind as we go through this story, because God is totally in control of this situation, although the brothers think they're in charge, the Ishmaelites now think they're in charge, and the only one that's in charge, just like the only one that's in charge of your circumstances, is the Lord himself. Look at verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was in the pit. The Lord is going to be in Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph. Here's the main point of the sermon. I'm putting it on the front end because some of you never make it to the back end. The main point is God is with you. Okay? God is always with you. Another way of saying that, there's never a moment where God is not fully and completely with you. His presence is always there. He is always in charge. He is always in good, is good. God is incapable of not being sovereignly in charge all the time of your circumstances. God is incapable of not doing what is only best for you. God was with Joseph. God is with you. God was with this young man. Another way of saying it is this, you're never alone. 
Now that should either bring you great comfort or great consternation. When you're alone on a business trip behind a locked door in a dark hotel room, God is there. When you have an opportunity to cheat on the test with a friend's paper beside you, God is there. My mom used to always tell me, now when you go on a date, remember, mom's always there. I'm in the back seat, which always freaked me out. Why would you be on a date with me? You should be at home with dad. But the point is God is always present. Let's see what happens in this young man's life. Verse 3. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he, had, he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of the house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made his, him overseer in the house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. The food he ate is, is personal issues. There's some personal things, Joseph, I'm going to take care of, but you have charge of everything else. Let me ask you a question. Did Potiphar believe in the theology of Joseph's God? Not at all. He was a polytheist. He, he worshiped many gods. But he saw that this man, wherever this man is, good things happen. And I want him in my house. My chariots have never run this well. My household has never been this clean. My books have never been this in order. I want this man to be in charge of everything. A huge part of the gospel of being a Christian is how you are as an employee. Are you succeeding secularly? And you're going to see through this that Joseph succeeded now, when I say Joseph succeeded, most of us would think financially, his portfolio is up, his benefits are better, he is a financial success, or maybe you think he had health, or maybe you think his kids were successful, they went to the right college, married the right people with the right majors, so they make the right salary. The Bible has a different definition of success than we do. The Bible's definition of success is living moment by moment in the reality of God's presence. Success biblically is you have a relationship daily with God. Anything above and beyond that is not talking about biblical success. That's just details of life. And so I believe one of the idols in this culture is financial success and I want you to know that right here at this point in this story, when he's in the pit and he's a slave, he is very successful. And he hasn't done anything yet. God bless this man. This man was a great employee. My desire is that other companies, when they're hiring in the city of Austin, would call Austin's Bible Church and say, we've got a couple of folks on our team that attend your church and we need to fill some positions. Can you give me some names? Christians should be the best employees. You may be sitting there thinking, but my job stinks. That's why they pay you. <laughs> if they didn't pay you, you don't show up and do your job. It's a hobby at that point. You show up, you get paid because your job allows you a living. That you and I would be great employees. How many of us go into the workplace tomorrow and the prayer as we walk in that office is, God, would you bless my boss because of my presence here, which means you're present here? Would you bless this corporation because they've hired me and that you are going to be represented through me? He was a great employee. People ask me sometimes, hey, how did you develop into a communicator? And I, I usually answer something like, dishes. And I go, dishes? I had a job in college where I washed dishes for seven, eight, nine-year-old kids at a camp. And then when I got to Dallas Theological Seminary, I washed dishes. I don't know why dishes are in my past, but I washed dishes for this young adult ministry, and I was taking the garbage to the dumpster. Tom Nelson, one of the guys that poured into me, the pastor at Denton Bible Church, a, a, an incredible Bible teacher, he used to have this, he still does, he has this program called Young Guns where young men would come and be in this year and a half long program to be trained for the ministry. And Will Blackman who attends here was in that program. David Pemberton who attends here was in that program. Many other guys here were in that program. 
And one of the main things that Tom makes you do in that ministry are chores. You vacuum, you clean the bathrooms, you cut grass. I remember asking Will Blackman, what's the thing you remember about Young Guns the most? He said, all I did was cut grass, it felt like. And I remember talking to Tom Nelson about this one time, and I said, okay, explain to me the chores and how that is about equipping men for the ministry. And here's what Tom Nelson said, and I want to quote him. I am far more concerned about how they vacuum and clean the bathroom over how big their ministry becomes numerically. He said, because if these men can be faithful in these chores, these little things, I know that the ministry will be an extension of their excellence, which will point to the excellence of Jesus. How are you doing secularly? See, some of us think that God's closer to us right now when we're singing our God reigns than he will be in the cubicle tomorrow. God is just as close there. We just don't recognize it. I think the reason Joseph is successful in a pagan culture is because he realized that God's presence is always with him. I can't tell you how much the realization of God's presence moment by moment in my life has kept me from doing stupid sins has protected me. God is here. God will know. The locked door doesn't keep the Spirit of God out of this hotel room. I can close the blinds, but I can't close the eyes of this Holy Spirit who is in this place. I think Joseph understood that. Potiphar comes in, here's my credit cards, here's my safety security number, here's my deposit box keys. It's all yours. I'm going to go take a nap because you are that good. See, God's method for building us into greatness is by causing us to serve under authority. If you don't serve well under authority, how in the world are you going to serve well with authority? Here's, here's a struggle I see a lot of times with men and women. We, we worry more about titles and authority and flow charts than just doing a great job. But I don't have a good boss. Joseph was not concerned about his boss because he had a boss. The Bible says when you work, work as unto God because you don't work for men, you work for the Lord. Joseph understood this. His faithfulness as a steward, his faithfulness as an inmate, his faithfulness as a vice president one day of a country had nothing to do with where he was geographically, had nothing to do with where he was circumstantially, had nothing to do with where he was emotionally. You think, you think he felt God's presence during this time? Sometimes he didn't. See, a lot of times our emotions and our feelings trump biblical truth. Folks, this book trumps your emotions. This book allows you to engage your emotions. This book establishes biblical emotions and feelings. And Joseph understood that I'm going to do this excellently. Now, see, Joseph's an 18-year-old man in a pagan culture. His family's betrayed him. He may never get married. He's a slave. He goes from being in a free family to being a slave. This man has every rationalization to act out. Would you and I have done it the same? If you were thrown into a pit for doing what's right, would you be faithful in the pit? Joseph is. Are you excellent in the lowest areas of life? Solomon said, see a man sloppy in his work, there's more hope for him than a fool. Now, here's where this gets interesting. This is why this was even harder than you and I realized. Look at the end of verse 6. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. He is the Brad Pitt of the Old Testament. It's the only person in the Bible that says those two things about. Other than him, there's one other woman in the Bible that says the same thing. See, this is genetic. His mama, Rachel, the beautiful Rachel, says the same thing about her. It's the only two people that says this. I mean, it, it, us guys, we, we would not like Joseph. He had a six-pack. We got a keg, okay? <laughs> this guy was good looking. Pastor, why do you make such a big deal about that? Because it makes this story all the more amazing. Look at verse 7. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. I love the fact that Moses doesn't even give this woman's name because she's irrelevant in biblical history. It's Potiphar's wife. And in the Hebrew, it has two words there. It doesn't say lie with me. It's an imperative form, which is a command. It says bed now. Bed now. And I did some Egyptian slave history study this week. Sexual favors were a norm for slaves to their masters during this time. 
part of your job was to do sexually what I tell you to do. So again, you've got an 18-year-old, hormone-flying, good-looking, Brad Pitt-type guy in a foreign country where no one knows him and no one will know, and a beautiful woman is now saying, bed now. He could rationalize it as, this could be a career builder, and I'm a slave, and if God wants me to be a good employee, I need to do what my boss tells me. Okay, God, here I am, send me. <laughs> he doesn't do that. And she says, bed now. you got to understand, too, he can't quit his job. He's a slave. He can't file a sexual harassment suit. He's a slave. What would you and I have done? By the way, women tend not to like this story in our Bible. They like the Dinah story because Dinah's the victim. They don't like this story. You know why they don't like this story? Because this culture has pitted men as wicked, evil perverts, and women are victims and sweet and always good people, and it's simply not true. I believe in equality for men and women. I believe that women are equally as wicked and evil as men. <laughs> Let me tell you, we have just as many women at Austin Ridge who struggle with porn addiction as men. I see just as many women leave their husbands and leave their families and leave their children for another man as I see women or men do it for another woman. It is equal. And this culture has made men look like perverts, and women are innocent and perfect, and it's simply not true. This is a wicked, evil woman. And you can see, women can tend to manipulate with tears, and you're going to see it with her. And I've been told, I don't know, but I've been told that some women actually can be flirtatious. <laughs> I've been told that some women like the attention of men. And here's what you got to do, men before you come across a woman like Potiphar's wife, because Proverbs says there are women that will lead you to hell. Here's what you have to do, men. You've got to determine in your mind, am I going to walk by those women or not? You see, he had to walk by this woman just like the fruit in Genesis 3 every day. He had to pass by her. He couldn't quit. He couldn't call in sick. There she is. And you've got to, you've got to have some resolve about you, men. And I think there's a difference in our culture, men and women, from opinion and conviction. Opinion is something you have in your mind. Conviction is something you have in your heart. Opinion is something that you hold. Conviction is something that holds you. Do you have convictions about your marriage? Young men, young women, students, you will make some decisions in the heat of a situation that will determine the rest of your life. And you have to be resolved on what you're going to do in that situation before that situation happens. If you're waiting to decide if you're going to be pure at midnight on the couch with your boyfriend or girlfriend, it's too late. You've got to make a resolution before that moment. And Joseph, even though he had been in a pit, even though he was now being pursued by this woman, has resolved that I'm not going to commit this sin against my Lord. What a stud. You know, I could build 30 or 40 years of integrity with you. I've, I've built, by God's grace, 10. And I can blow it by doing something stupid in a moment. You don't think for a minute that women don't flirt with pastors? You see, pastors get women when they're at their lowest, and the pastors always look like they're at their best. Right? You see me preach, you hear me talk about my wife, and then I get a woman in my office who's crying, and his husband is, and he's a jerk, and you understand me, and, and why can't he talk to me the way you talk to me? You don't think that's possible for pastors? Why do you think pastors fall all the time? And let me tell you something. There's some convictions I have about my marriage. And my wife is not perfect, but she's much less of a lug nut than I am. I don't counsel women long term. Even if that comes across as uncaring or I'm not going to be present, I don't counsel them long term. I'm not going to put myself in that situation. I'm not going to meet with a woman in my office after office hours when people outside my door have gone home. I'm not going to have lunch with a woman that's not my wife. I don't care what the situation is. I'm going to have someone else there. I'm not going to be in a car alone with another woman besides someone else being in the car. I'm just not going to do it. Why? Because I know my flesh. Pastor, you mean to tell me you're capable of cheating on Courtney, you bet I am given the wrong circumstances. But by God's grace, to stand on a conviction to say, I'm not going to do this against Courtney, and I'm not going to do this against my Lord. That's what Joseph is doing. 
You got convictions? Because see, culture's opinions change all the time, don't they? We are men and women of conviction. Here's an attractive, well-kept, bored, lonely housewife. 17, 18-year-old kid. He has every reason to be angry and resentful. He has every reason to be cynical about God and his promises. No friends, no family. I'm just a slave obeying orders. Not every woman is a victim. Not every man is a pervert. Let's look at verse 8. But he refused. Circle that guy. Circle that little phrase. He refused. Why? Because he had convictions and not opinions. He refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He calls it what it is. It's adultery. How can I do this thing against who is Joseph thinking about? He's thinking about his boss, and he's thinking about his Lord. Who is Joseph not thinking about? Himself. Who do we usually think about when we fall into a dumb sin? Ourselves. I deserve this. People don't understand what I've been going through. People don't understand what's been happening. People don't understand how tired I am. I deserve this. No, you deserve to obey the one who died for you. And Joseph had convictions. Paul says among God's people there should not even be a hint of sexual immorality. What's, what's wrong with a little flirting? I'm not going to do anything. What's wrong with just a little batting of the eyes? See, I think this man showed up at work every day and she had a different outfit on every day just for Joseph. I imagine some women here in this room fantasize about other men who are not their husbands and when they know they're going to run into them, they look a little prettier that day. What's wrong with just a little bit, Pastor? The problem is little sins become big sins. If you're dumb enough to do what we're talking about, you're wicked enough to slide into what we're warning about. But he refused. He knows that God sees all. Why is Joseph solid morally? Because he had convictions and not opinions, and he understood the reality of living in the presence of God moment by moment, day by day. It doesn't matter where you are geographically, circumstantially, emotionally. God is good and he is there. I remember baptizing a guy one, day, one, one time and you know, I, I took him under and I always hoped to pull him back up. So I was going to pull him back up and I pulled him up and he just <laughs> spit out water. <laughs> I was odd. I baptized a few other people and I called him and I said, what was that about? He said, well, I want to make sure my tongue got saved. Another friend said, you know, the last thing that gets saved on us is our right foot driving, right? I remember Chuck Swindoll used to say, in, in fact, he used to, anytime he'd travel, and he'd travel a lot, he'd go in a hotel room, he would always tell the people at the front desk, I want someone to go get the TV and take it out of the room before I get up there because there's a little box on that TV, and for $6.99, I can fantasize. He says a lot of times I'd go places I'd ask, and I'd go in there, and the TV's still in there. I'd take it out of the wall, I'd unhook it, and I'd put it in the hallway. Because that man has convictions and not just opinions. He is not making a provision for the flesh. And we will play with sin and we'll say it's not that big of a deal and compared to everyone else and it's just in my head. I'm never going to act out upon it. Brad, have you ever cheated on Courtney? I haven't. But by the grace of God. Are you capable? Every day. What's the best way not to mess a marriage up to have a great marriage? Look at verse 10. And as she spoke to Joseph, circle this, day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. She's in that room. I'm going to go work in this room right now. She's got a nice new outfit on. I'm not even going to look at her. I'm not going to take a double take. I'm not going to fantasize. Stud. Verse 11. But one day, and, and by the way, the biggest decisions of our life always happen on one day, right? But one day, when he went to the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, which I think was the plan by her, she caught him 
by his garment, saying, and by the way, that word caught in the Hebrew literally is grab. It's violent. It's a violent term. She grabs him by his garment, saying, lie with me. Bed now. But he felt the garment in her, her hand. He left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. Ironically enough, it's the second time an outer garment's been pulled off of Joseph. I love that Joseph did what Paul already told Timothy to do, flee sexual immorality. You don't debate it. You don't read a book about it. You run. You run. You get out of there. You don't try to win her over to Christ. It's not a time for evangelism. You run. <laughs> And I just, I wish I could have been there, this woman holding this outer garment, and there goes Joseph, Brad Pitt looking, streaking down the hall. And he's 17 or 18, and he's in a foreign country, and no one would know, and no one would see him, and his family betrayed him, and God hasn't spoken to him in a while, and everything tells him to do it, and he doesn't. Why? Because he has convictions. He's a Christian. It doesn't matter if God keeps his end of the deal I'm going to be obedient. The how and the what is not up to Joseph. The how and the what is up to God. What's up? My business is obedience. She called him. It's interesting. It's the only time in your Bible where it uses that language for a woman toward a man. See, men will rape a woman without any words or dialogue. Women seduce men with a lot of dialogue. And it's interesting here. She's acting more like a man. Bed. Now, it's supposed to make you, as you're reading through this, to remember the last chapter, Judah. She's acting just like Judah. She's a female version of Judah. Bed now. What's interesting, too, is he's a slave, and yet she's the one enslaved to her lust, and he's actually the only one that's free in this whole entire story. She says, bed now. Look at verse 13. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her households and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. She's manipulating with her tears. She's saying her side of the story. Here's what I learned about hearing a side of the story. Our natural reaction when we hear someone's side of the story is to always react toward their side here's what I've learned there's always two sides to every story sometimes you'll hear a side of a story and you'll think how could he what a jerk how could she what's she thinking and then maybe over time you start hearing a little more it's like oh okay there's more going on there here's the thing about God God knows every side to every story <laughs> so she's crying she's playing the victim and she said she told him the same story saying, or verse 16, then she laid up his, her, his garment by her until his master came home. I think she laid the garment on the bed. She laid there. She got her dramatic face on. She rubbed her mascara around her face. Husband's coming home. And she told him the same story saying, the Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came into me to laugh at me. It's your fault. You're the one who brought the guy here. What's a woman to do? But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, she left his he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. Now, verse 19, what do men do? Where's my gun? Look at verse 19. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me. His anger was kindled. Now, it's very, it's very unclear in the Hebrew the object of his anger at this point. He doesn't say, and he went to track down Joseph. Or he went to find Joseph. He was just mad. I believe, and I'll tell you why in a second, I believe that he was just as mad at her as Joseph. I believe he was mad because he's losing the best CEO he's ever had. I believe that this woman is not the first time she's ever pulled this stuff, and he knows the kind of woman she is, which is probably why he travels as much as he does. <laughs> Verse 20. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. You see, this was a capital offense in Egypt. He should have been killed immediately. Why was he put into prison? Because I think this husband is on a little bit to the wife. But he's got to save face. He can't let this charge go. She's already cried to the whole entire household. He would be a fool not to punish him, so he puts him in prison. God's in charge. So here's a guy who every time he honors God, it backfires. 
I'm honoring God. My brothers beat me up and throw me into a cistern. I get sold as a slave. I honor God. I'm a great employee. And now I get a false charge. I'm thrown into prison for a rape I didn't commit. What would you do at this point? All right, God, that's it. One, two, th- you've had your chances, God. You never pull through. I, if I had a dime every time someone said, hey, I tried the God thing and, and it didn't work, I'd be a rich man. Not Joseph. What Joseph does, he goes to jail and he says, I'm going to be the best inmate I can be and I'm going to trust God. <laughs> Look at verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph. Notice the Lord's not going to take him out of prison for a while. The Lord's presence doesn't mean deliverance from your trials. The Lord's presence means strength in your trials. He was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The warden goes, I'm going to go watch some football and take a nap. You know you're a dependent person when you're in prison and they give you the keys to all the prisoners. Keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Again, the warden is not a believer. Potiphar is not a believer. It doesn't matter if your boss is a believer. It doesn't matter if your boss attends Austin Ridge. It's sold out for Jesus. Your job is to be the best employee you can be, trusting in God, standing on convictions, and not opinions because God is good and God's in charge, and I'm going to be the man, I'm going to be the woman that I claim to be by loving Jesus. And now he's got the jail, and he's taking it over. By the way, God's delays are not God's denials in your life. God does his best work in his delays. Don't miss the delays. Don't miss the waiting. Don't miss the jail time. God only does that to those he loves the most. Your friend that nothing ever bad happens to, God's probably not doing too much in their life. And there he's just letting them do their thing. So Joseph's in part of the jail. He went from the pit in Shechem to the penthouse in Egypt, and now he's back in a dungeon. One of my favorite names of Jesus in the Bible is Emmanuel, God with us. Right before he leaves, he says, And behold, I'm with you even until the end of the earth. God is here. Pastor, I don't feel it. doesn't matter. His character is not based on what you emotionally feel. Pastor's circumstances don't say he's here. It doesn't matter. His circumstances are what he uses to do his best work in your life. Pastor, it hurts. That's when he's doing it. Pastor, it doesn't make sense. Hey, Joseph, you're in prison now. You remember that dream you had? Oh, yeah. What was the dream about? All my brothers are going to bow down to me one day. You still believe that? I do. Even now? I do. Why? Because God is good and the how and the what is his business. My business is to be faithful. You're going to see this man stays in the prison a few years. I've been a pastor now here at this church for a decade. And I've watched some Christians get deep and mature and solid in their following of Jesus Christ. And it has been fun to watch. Folks who have come in here and they go from being consumers, I don't like that. I like this. Why don't we do this? Why don't we have that? To just, man, God's here. I've watched that with me. It's beautiful. And I've also watched some folks who have been here for years. And they've just learned and conditioned themselves to thrive in mediocrity. And I wonder if God's presence is reality on a Wednesday any more than it is on a Sunday night. Or a Monday morning. I've come to believe that naturally great men and women are not born great. They are born ordinary. And God does some tough stuff in their life that makes them great. But you're going to have to trust him. There are men and women that haven't cheated on their spouses. There are men and women who go home every night and they're obedient. There are men and women at this church who don't cheat on their taxes and don't cut the corners. And it's not about how much they can make. It's more about who they are. And for you, I want to encourage you this morning to keep being faithful because the great eternal return is coming. 
And there are men and women who will do not deflate their testimony secularly or morally by a moment of passion. Or spiritually crater when God doesn't do what they want him to do. And there are men and women in this church that have cratered spiritually at times. And yet they're walking with Jesus now. And they're a new creature in Christ. And they're intimate with him again. And God is moving in your life. And God is forgiving you. And God is giving you a new place in intimacy with him. And I love that. Be faithful. Have you resolved yourself to be faithful regardless of geography or circumstance or emotions? Guys, we're going to be faithful to this book, and we're going to be faithful to our Lord at Austin Ridge. And there's one in this book that's much greater than Joseph, and his name is Jesus. And he was betrayed by his brothers, and he was left for dead. But you can't kill a perfect man, so he resurrected from the dead again. Jesus gave his life for us. Why do we cling so much to ours? If you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, I urge you, where else would you go? It's either trusting him or it's on you. Pastor, how do I do that? You just ask him to save you. Forgive me of my sins. I am a sinner. I'm a pervert. I'm a lug nut. Left to myself, I'm always going to do what I want to do. And I want to do what God wants me to do. And I want you to be in charge of my life. And will you change my heart? And he will. And you know what he's going to do? He's got more cisterns and more pits than you probably care to know on the front end. And that's where he's going to do his best work. Because as Peter said, these light and momentary trials are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I'd rather be in a pit for a while so I can be with him forever. I'd rather learn in a sister now instead of have to learn by destroying my family. I'd rather be faithful now and not be embarrassed when I stand before him then. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for Genesis 39. I thank you that there's finally a man in this book that we can go, that's who I need to be like. Father, Joseph wasn't perfect. And we're going to see Joseph struggle some in this story, but oh, Father, that we would be men and women of conviction and not opinions. That we don't have to get our cues from this culture about what sexuality looks like because you have been clear and it is a conviction and our opinion doesn't sway that. And how we give is a conviction and not opinion. And how we serve and how we trust. And Father, as we are unleashed in the city of Austin tomorrow with bosses, some good and some bad, some jobs that are awesome and some that we'd rather not be in, that we would be the best employees we can be because that is gospel. And that our place of employment would be blessed because of our representation of Jesus Christ. It's in his mighty name we pray. Amen.